Welcome everyone to another episode of Board Rumors, episode 15, How to Have a Good Convention Experience. Today we're going to be talking to you about some of our experiences, my personal experience at Toy Fair last weekend, uh, co-ops in space, and what is going to be the next big thing. We'll hit all those before we get to our big topic of the night. Right now I want to give our panel a chance to introduce themselves. All right. Uh, I'm Ryan Metzler. Uh, I am a video reviewer for the Dice Tower. Uh, you may have seen me there. Uh, and hopefully just going to contribute with my experiences here. So, Hello, I'm Christopher Bedell. I am the design director of Greater Than Games. Um, and we make a lot of exciting games and go to a lot of exciting conventions as a result. So I'll be able to chime in on, on various levels there. Brian? Awesome. Is it me? I'm yeah. Brian Tucker. I'm Brian Fisher from Nevermore Games, also co-designer of Chicken Caesar. Um, and uh, my buddy and I are actually uh, taking over a con that was kind of bequeathed to us. So we're going to try to uh, gonna talk about the challenges we're having in, in finding space and, and what we're going to try to do with that this year. And uh, I'm Angelo Benedetto, and I help run OwlCon, which is a sort of moderate to small size gaming convention. And lastly, I'm Matt Morgan, writer at Wired's Geek Dad blog and your host tonight. Uh, I'll be trying to talk about the experience of being a member of the media at a convention. Uh, and to start that off, we'll talk about a trade show uh, that I was at this past weekend, Toy Fair, uh, which is a, a very unique show in that it's not intended for the fans, it's not intended for the gamers. Uh, this is for the retailers and to have them come in and select which games they want to stock on their shelves. So you get a lot of access to the companies and have a good opportunity to see, you know, what games they're going to be showing off for the next year. Uh, and has did anyone follow the news? I know, you know, Board Game Geek News was doing some updates from Toy Fair. Anyone want to raise their hand if they, they saw something this week that popped up as a new game coming out? Well, apparently no one reads about Toy Fair, so I will talk to you about what I saw. <laughs> Uh, I, I went to about 20 different booths to see 20 all these different publishers. Uh, probably the best of them being Game Right, surprisingly. Uh, I mean, they they always make good games, but I, I was never expecting to say they were going to be the best games I saw at Toy Fair last weekend. So I will pick two games to bring to you guys before I talk your ears off. Uh, one from Game Right, Cube Quest. Uh, there's been some art being tossed around for this. Uh, you know, raise your hands. Have you guys played Summoner Wars? Familiar with Summoner Wars? Picture Summoner Wars, but instead of you know strategically moving cards around the board, you're just flicking the dice at your opponent, the other side of the table. <laughs> and, and instead of a summoner, you have a king die, where you're trying to knock the king off the back of the table. So it might actually be good. That would be awesome. Ooh. 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 All right, so raise your hand if you <laughs> like Summoner Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a waffling hand there from Brian Fisher. Some small modicum of support. So that that's Cube Quest. I would absolutely look forward to that. Uh, I think it's for like ages eight and up, but it's actually a lot deeper than what I just described. All of the dice have special powers. They have point values. There's squad building. Way deeper. If I, if I was eight or ten years old, I would be going nuts for this game right now. You might have, you know fiddliness in your configuration you can have. And the, the second game I wanted to bring to you guys that should be on your radar is a party game. And this one is not from Game Right. It's from an independent publisher uh, out of Brooklyn called Shmovie. It's uh, S-C-H-M-O-V-I-E. Uh, and this is a very interesting game that forces you to create pun movie titles. <laughs> uh, uh, probably the best thing you can do is Type in Shmovie to Facebook and go to their page. They run a daily game every night at 11 o'clock. Basically, you'll get a, a genre, such as, say, uh, action films, and then you'll get a subject you know, from a deck of cards. So, you know, for instance, we had... Oh, what, what was one I, I participated in the other night? Uh, it was, like, a vampire movie about, you know, like, gay Dracula. So I had you know, the bat cage instead of the bird cage. I think they already made three of those, or four. <laughs> I may be wrong, though. Uh, it, it, three and a half, perhaps? <laughs> Are you counting the Underworld movies, too? They're right. kind of cheesy towards the end. 
So There's... I've talked your ears <laughs> off enough about Toy Fair. So I we will move on from that topic. Clubs. 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 That's the only game Ryan I Ryan Metzler. Ryan Metzler heard about clubs from Toy Fair. What did you think about clubs? About clubs. Uh, apparently a new climbing game. I don't know if anybody's played Teach You or Haggis. Everybody should play Teach You and or Haggis. Uh, but apparently it's a new uh, climbing game from it's North Star Games, right? Um, and so I, I'm excited about that. I don't really know much about it, but I'm always excited to hear that there's new climbing games coming out, uh, more trick-taking type styles. So I think that's going to be a good one and something I'm interested in seeing. I have not seen the point point of sale box for that. It was pretty cool. Did you? Yeah. It's a little eye-catching, big orange box, big club on the front. Yeah. Nice. If you want to see a picture of it, I put one in my post about Toy Fair on Wired's Geek Dad blog. <laughs> it's, it's not a cool, like, bloody, like, hit somebody club, though. No, 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 no. Not at all. More like a like golf party. club? Golf club would have been good. No. Like a dance like, club? Like a, like a disco like club? Right. Like a disco yes, tech. Just like right. a nightclub. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Board gamers love going to nightclubs. It's the one thing Absolutely. I know about our hobby. <laughs> Gen Con's just pretty much a rave. Yeah. Just like that. So our next short session topic here, we were talking about this before we got on the air, co-ops in space. Is this, is this the next big thing, which we'll talk about next? Okay, you know, we've got, so. You've got Artemis, space team on the video game side. You've got space cadets. Uh, I know, Christopher, you had, you had mentioned wanting to talk about one of the, uh, one of the video game versions of the you know, co-ops in space genre. What are your yeah, thoughts absolutely. here? Yeah, Ar Artemis is a phenomenal game. I actually got to play it for the first time just last week. I had heard a lot about it but never played it before. And, man, that game is a blast. Uh, all the different stations you play as are great, and I want nothing more than to continually captain an Artemis ship. That is my ideal spot in life. It, it was running nonstop. Alcon just happened, the con I organized uh, this past weekend. It was running nonstop all weekend, and we had people who registered for nothing but that game all weekend. Nice. I am not so, surprised. So do you guys think there's a place in the, you know, the con scene, even if you're a strictly board game con, you know, throw some of this co-op video gaming in there, set up Space yeah, sure. Team or Artemis? Absolutely. Yeah, you, get, you actually get a very similar experience if you think about it. I mean, the days of the LAN are kind of dead, but if you can get a bunch of people in the same room and they're all playing the game together, it doesn't matter which game it is. If they're all, like, yelling at each other and screaming at each other and having a great time, why not? I mean, that's, I think it's awesome. You heard it here. LAN parties and board gaming cons separated at birth. It's a lot more social, I think, than your typical LAN was, right? Right. Absolutely. I, I was stuck at an airport for like six hours with a group of nerds, and we created um, an ad hoc peer-to-peer -peer network and ran Artemis on a series of laptops off of one dangerously overrun power strip in, um, in an airport. And it was great because the network we made was so lousy that we every five minutes would lose one of the players. So we'd be flying through space, and it's like, ah, uh, Helm is down. Guys, we're under attack and Helm is down, so let's just spin in space and keep shooting. It was the best ship ever. It was awesome. <laughs> keep firing assholes. <laughs> awesome. Ryan, you have any experience with these games, or is it, is it a pass for you? The, the, video, the video game aspect, no. I mean, I've played the, uh, the cooperative space game, board game, Space Cadets. What did you think of that? Space Lord. I love Space Cadets. Great game. Um, I think the, the aspect of everybody has their own little puzzle thing to focus on really takes away from the cooperative, uh, like, alpha gamer syndrome that you get with a lot of the, the earlier co-ops that were made, where you, things like Pandemic, where you have one gamer who's like, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. This game kind of takes that concept that gives it to the captain, but the captain really has no control over what happens in the long run. They can, they can try and dictate what they want to do, but it doesn't end up necessarily happening, because everybody does their own thing. Um... And I think it, it really manages that well. I've also played Space Alert, uh, which I hate. Uh, <laughs> you know, you'd think with a similar theme and a similar concept, I would like both games, but uh, the way they handle it is completely different. I don't like the, the soundtrack that comes with Space Alert. I didn't find the game uh, interesting at all. But uh, Space Cadets, very, very fond of Space Cadets. Uh, one of my best games of last year, so... Nice. Th doesn't sound like anyone's had a bad experience so far. I mean, aside from Space Alert, which is an older title, but this new crop of co-ops in space, all hits. You, know, you mentioned uh, Space Cadets, you know, designed by Jeff Engelstein, and this will transition to a story I have to tell. I went to Jeff's house maybe a month ago for a game day he was having, where it was, it was board games, and then he had a six-computer Artemis set up, 
you know, in, in one of the bedrooms upstairs. So I, I walk in, and apparently what happened here is, you know, five people sit down to play Artemis, and they're all discoordinated. Stephen Bonacore from Stronghold Games walks in, you know, not having participated in the game. Big dick swinging, bust open the door. <laughs> I'm captain. Start. I see him in there just directing people. It's like spinning image of Captain Kirk, telling everyone what to do. The whole team is coordinated. Everyone's having a great time. I didn't get a chance to try Artemis, but it's on my list now because everyone seems to be having a great time, even even if they were just Stephen in the back yelling at people and telling them what to do. It's awesome. So there's well, a role I, for everybody. I discovered Space Team just a few weeks ago, and uh, Space Team is, a, is an app. Uh, you can get it on your phone. It's only on iOS right now, but it's getting ready to come out for Android from what I've seen. And it's like a, uh, you know, maybe one day it'll come out for Android. But anyway, it's, it's kind of a watered-down version of Artemis. Maybe. And you, there's actually an, an Artemis iOS version, too. Um, that yeah, the I Artemis know, iOS version, it's the same as the regular. You can, just, you can run it off of an iOS device. Yeah, oh, okay, okay, cool. Yeah, well, I hosted my... I actually hosted some of the games we did off of an iPad. Um, we had iPads, we had Windows, Mac, and PC running. The Mac it was running through um, a virtual machine thing and the Linux, because it's, it's for Windows, but there are ways around that. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you can. It, it works very smoothly. Sweet. Nice. Well, have, you, have any of you guys tried Space Team? I think a lot of people have tried it. Nah, yeah, not me. It, it's, it's good fun. It's really, really quick to set up. It's, like, super retro and pixely and... And kind of funny. My wife and I actually have played it several times just before we go to bed because it's just kind of addictive and have a bunch of friends over and just kind of jump on it really quick and play it. It's a lot of fun. You're yelling and screaming at each other and there's, you know, there's slime all over your screen and there you go. And it's have got you, a great start screen. I love turning that button because everything gets fast and loud. Have you played Space Team in bed? I have. But were you the green lady and she was Captain Kirk or was it the other way around? He, he, no, that was, that's right. Oh. Huh? Okay. Right. Well, but, we don't okay. discriminate here on board rumors. <laughs> I find that to be a perfectly acceptable way to end. Well, I, know, I know he won't bring it up on his own, but but Christopher Bedell has got right behind him a, a space co-op game that's going to be coming out from Greater Than Games at some point, Galactic Strike Force, and I'm freaking I'm going to crawl through this monitor and steal that copy from him. So I hope he needs that to tell doesn't us happen about for it. all of our sakes. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, Matt. Thank you, Brian. Sure. So, right, anyway, b before we run out of time to talk about our real topic, we'll go into <laughs> our, our last short <laughs> session topic, the next big thing. I'm going to give you guys five things that might be the next big thing. And the reason we're talking about this is you'll see it all over board game forums. You know, about every five years, we get the next big thing. Five years ago, we got Dominion. You know, Everyone's got five deck builders in their game closet now. Five years before Dominion, you know, it was something else was big. I think, you know, worker placement games were blowing up at the time. So it's been five years. Where's the big thing? So here are your choices. You know, we have the five choices, and we'll take a poll. And you guys out there on Twitter, you guys out there on YouTube, you want to reply, tell us which one of these ones you think it will be and why. You know, maybe we'll, if we have time, we'll read out a couple of the, you know, best responses. And, and Brian Fisher, he's, tech, he's typing to all of us, games with chickens is not the next big thing. Don't <laughs> listen to Brian Fisher. You have no idea what you're talking about, Matt Morgan. <laughs> no, I, I'm actually making all this up. You <laughs> called me on my bluff. So <laughs> your, five, your five things that might be the next big thing are micro games. You know, these you know, 16 cards, play the entire game with 16 cards and a, and a couple cubes. Maybe you participated in the board members design contest and made a micro game. Maybe. A lot of you did. Over yes. 30 of you submitted. We'll get to that later. Uh, so perhaps micro games are the next big thing. Perhaps it's real time dice rollers like Escape. Uh, perhaps it's bizarre Euro mechanics uh, such as you know big spinning gears in Zulkin, the Mayan calendar, or if you've seen the new uh, Via Appia from Queen Games, which is you know. Pushing stones off a ledge like you're in a, a you know coin dropper machine at the arcade. First queen game that's interested me in forever. It's very interesting. Uh, maybe it's Hello Kitty Hero Clicks announced by WizKid Games. You Are know, you this serious? Could, this could take. <laughs> <laughs> I was at their booth at Toy Fair and I saw the Hello Kitty Gravity Feed you know store display next to all the other uh, Hero Clicks boxes. 
I just assumed it was collectible figurines. <laughs> the next day, the press release came out that no, those are clicks. Fenrir Surprise is back. Exactly. <laughs> and perhaps your last option is there will be no next big thing this year. The cop out answer. So let's start off. How many of you are going to cop out and say there's going to be no next big thing? I don't like any of those answers. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I think there'll be a next big thing, but I don't think it's any of those. All right, that, that's the answer then. We I think it's one of those. We games. haven't seen it yet. Man, I think I, it's cooperative I, I, games. Do you think I, I, it's, who thinks it's micro games? No. Who thinks it's real time dice rollers? I, I think I, it might be real time dice rollers. Can I at least explain why I think it's Expl- micro games? Explain. Okay. Give us some exposition here, Brian. Now, there's certain levels, obviously, of what next big thing is, and there's something about micro games that we have to get out there on the table. Okay, if the next big thing is going to be measured by financial success, no, because they're micro games. Okay, but if the next big next big thing is just talk, it's just the trending, talking about it on Twitter a lot, talking about it on Facebook a lot. It's all over BGG. There's a bunch of stuff going on. The micro games are is, are already there. There's like three or four different game design contests going on right now. There's one on BGG. There's one with board rumors. We just had one at Unpub. There's going to be at least another four or five by this summer going on. Micro games and mini games are blowing up. Now, you know, it, whether it's a, it's a creative exercise for somebody or it's just a fun little thing, I'm not saying that it's going to turn into big sales of anything. I'm not saying that it's going to be, you know, a publisher's dream. But it's definitely something that's happening within the game design community, and that's pretty cool. Right here in front of me, I have Pixel Tactics from that came out from Level 99. This is a mini game, part of their mini game library. One of the best card games I've ever played. And I'm, I know that sounds absolutely crazy, but this is one of my favorite games right now. It's got a lot of strategy. It's only like 50 cards. It's it's fantastic, and I think that this kind of thing is, is possible. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of groups and people and designers and publishers paying attention to too many games as a format, whether they're print and play or free or really cheap or whatever. Nice. That's my two cents. Honestly, the next big thing is going to be more digital shifting of board games. So you're going to see a lot more interaction between board games, and you're going to see a lot more interaction between the board game and the the video game aspect of things. Like you're seeing with Artemis being a real time cooperative video game, but it's it's really uh, got that board game feel in it. You're going to see that transitioning over a lot more, I think, in the so, coming year. So, Ryan, are you going to be uh, you know, throwing down $1,500 for a tester of Google Glass? <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't have $1,500, but if I did, I would. Well, maybe so. six, if we have 6000 we four of us could get Google Glass. And we can you know, you know, have it analyze the odds and count cards for us. And we and could we could we'll live be playing broadcast as, like, our live broadcast. Gamers. The the other problem yeah. is I'd have to get myself to one of the three possible cities you can pick them up in. So, uh, and I don't live anywhere near any of those three cities. You know they have these things these days, these big metal tubes with wings that fly through the air. Yeah, that's like, additional money. I can take it. If you're your going to drop fifteen hundred dollars to the Google goggles, what's another three hundred to get the plane ticket? Google sure. goggles is a different application, man. Google Glass. Oh, semantics. Glass. <laughs> Let the nerd come out, Ryan. It's okay. I think it looks awesome. So anyway, back to the next big thing. Uh, you know, our guest Angelo here. Do you have an opinion on on whether it's one of these? Maybe it's Hell Kitty Hero Clicks. Maybe it's that, one of that's your, your own creations. That's scary to me. I, I think <laughs> that probably the micro games stand a pretty good chance, but again, if, it, if they don't make any money, they're probably, I mean, are they going to last a long time? Who, you're going to develop them for fun, but you're not going to see them as, as developed by you know, any big companies with big distribution or anything like that, right? So, mm-hmm. But again, not in the game design business, so you guys would possibly know that better. Um, I think, uh, you know, as a, as a nod to Christopher, the, the cooperative games that uh, I've seen you know, more and more of, uh, I know a lot of people are getting into those, and I don't know if it's too late for them to be the next big thing or not, but I think that they're definitely uh, improving and seeing more of them. So. Nice. I think as far as defining what the next big thing is, you'll have to wait until five years from now, yeah. look at your collection, and say, God damn, won't people stop making this? You know, X, Y. <laughs> then you'll know that that was the big thing. Maybe I, you didn't I know what it's time. That whatever the next big thing is, it is not collectible. Yes, That's when you open, open your closet door and micro games fall on you and bury you for like five hours as you climb out, then, <laughs> as, as Brian Fisher shows, option D results five years from now, Hello Kitty 40K. Yes. It's happening. 
That's so scary. In space, <laughs> Practically you already hear a feline scream. Look at the little years, frog orcs. Years the ago, we, we decided we should come up with uh, for uh, rules for fighting uh, uh, various things that you would find around the house that were not supposed to be games. So <laughs> uh, we, we considered making rules for uh, war games with uh, Beanie Babies. So, nice. Interesting. I don't think we would have gotten official permission for that, but it would have been fun. They can smother entire squads. Yes, well, and and you know, you know they were coming these days, out. With, they're pretty cheap. But, yeah, sure. <laughs> Not at the time they weren't. Talk about the next big thing ten years ago, fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you guys want to talk about um, con conventions? Yes, <laughs> what we're doing right now. We are talking about how to have a good experience at a convention, and we're going to try to bring it to you from a bit of a unique angle talking about it from the convention organizer side, the publisher side, and the media side. Uh, and maybe we'll talk about the attendee side, but, you know, that's been done a lot. You've probably heard that about 20 times already. So I'd like to start out from the game publisher side, you know, Brian and Christopher here, talking about what it takes for you guys to really have that successful con experience. You know, what, what's step, step one for you guys in playing out your con? Uh, Brian, you want to jump on this or you want me to go? Um, I, can, I can promise you yours is going to be a lot more interesting than mine, so why don't you take it? <laughs> well, for, for us, a big part of it is, um, is, is planning really far in advance, is knowing what our con schedule is a good year ahead of time, figuring out you know, what, what, what we need to do to get there. With a sort of, each con has a different sort of flavor, a different sort of drive, and learning what the drive and the flavor of a convention is, and then matching that with how we show up. We don't just do the exact same thing at every con. We try to have to try to try to kind of tailor our focus. Certainly, we have the same games, but what how we present them and, and what we do with our banners, what we do with our booths, is going to change from con to con based on the sort of people that go to those cons, based on the area that con is. Um, so really, getting to know the convention before, you know, and you don't have to go to a convention to get to know it, but just, you know, read some things online, talk to the people that run the convention, just kind of get a, a lay of the land. Um, and then moving from there, it's, it's finding out, okay, now we know what the convention wants from us. Having a, I mean, this is something that I say about pretty much all, all aspects of, of what we do as a company, is having a business plan, having a business plan, a micro business plan for the convention to say, okay, here's our plan for the convention. Here's our goal specifically. Here's our set of goals for this convention. Uh, here's a best case scenario here at the convention. We sell all of our things. What do we do if we sell all of our things by day one? What is our plan for the rest of the con? Um, and a worst case scenario, we sell absolutely nothing. What do we do there? And so that sort of pre-planning really makes a lot more of the convention smooth sailing. Um, this year right now, as we're looking at conventions going forward for the rest of this year, we're dealing with the fact that in previous years, we've been able to show up at a convention. It'll be the three of us that run the company, plus maybe a couple of friends to help us out, uh, and we're good to go. We can't do that anymore. At Gen Con this fall, we have a 20-foot by 30-foot booth island thing. And so we're having, we're recruiting minions and citizens to come and work at our booth and run that because we can't possibly take care of all those things and run all the demos and all those things. So it's, it's moving forward and evolving as a company and figuring out what the conventions demand to make it work. Are, are you to the point, out of curiosity, are you to the point where you will only attend really large conventions like Gen Con or, okay. No, no, we will. Pretty much most cons are correct for us as a company, but what it comes down to is the cost to get there. If a convention's right. in Seattle, I, we have to fly there and we have to ship product. If a convention, there's a, really, a, a smaller convention that we're going to in Kansas City um, in, this, in the summer, that it's, it's a much smaller convention than anything else we're going to, but I can put as much product in the back of my car and drive there in four hours, and so our overhead for that convention is really low, and so our expectations right. like, don't have to be quite as much. What do you think, uh, so if you had to fly somewhere and ship product, what's the smallest convention you, I'm not trying to get you for, for my con, but what, uh, you, what you would, know you know I'm not would be the smallest con that you would consider going to? Um, you know, it's not as much about this, honestly, um, I'll go to any con that I can get to affordably. Um, it's not as much about the size as it is about the timing. Uh, if you look at, on our website, we have an events thing that we say what all the different dates of the cons we are, and every so often somebody will contact us and be like, oh, come to our convention, and we want to. We want to go to every convention, because conventions are awesome. 
Um, they're really fun for us. They're a ton of work, but they're good word of mouth. They're a great, as a game publisher, you should be going to every convention you can possibly go to. But for us, like this fall, we're doing a convention, a week off, a convention, a week off, a convention, a week off, a convention, a week off um, in, in a row. Um, I think starting late in July. You'll and never so, not be sick. <laughs> no, it's cool. I'm gonna wear I'm gonna wear just a, a big like gas mask suit the entire time. <laughs> that won't be intimidating so, um, at all. <laughs> It'll fit the new theme. Right. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> you know, one thing I'm curious to know is when you look at a con and try to evaluate it. You know, do you consider what type of gaming goes on there? Whether it's schedule fixed schedule, you have to register all your events ahead of time, or whether it's you know open free form play. And does that affect the amount of, you know, you know, random demo space, you know, pickup demos that you're going to run? Um, yeah, yes and no. We kind of monop- we, we have bucked the system on several cons that we've gone to where the con's like, all of the gaming goes on in our gaming room and you have to pay, like, $5 or something, something like that to get into the gaming room and then you can play demos. And we're like, well, we run free demos at our booth all day every day. So if you don't want to pay to play de- games, you can come to our booth to play our games for free. It's launch day. But, you uh, it's, you know, but so, because we make sure that there's an important aspect of our booth is that a small corner of our booth is dedicated to selling games and the rest of it is just playing the games. Because the best advertisement for our games is if you play them, you will buy them. So. Sure. Um, half of half of Nevermore Games is is at PressCon this week. Uh, PressCon is a medium sized con out in Charlottesville, Virginia, and uh, our our big concentration for this year is is to not do what Chris is doing. Not that Chris is doing anything wrong, but we aren't we we aren't at that at that place yet. Our our, our big concentration this year is to focus on Gen Con and all the other conventions, but Gen Con is kind of a primary one for us in 2014, so we're already making those plans, like Chris said, already looking at hotels, already looking at all those options. Um, So this year, we're going to conventions, lots of conventions, mainly small, medium-sized ones will also be at Gen Con, and we're just demoing. So we're not, you know, there's not going to be any booth presence, there's us at a table demoing nonstop. So PressCon's a really interesting one, because PressCon is is a convention where 90% 90% of the people there, it seems, are there for tournament play. It, it goes from like a Tuesday to a Sunday. It's all tournament play the whole time. Um, but you'll still see, you'll see Nevermore, you'll see Dice Hate Me is, is there right now, I believe. Um, they were there last year. Um, and, you know, there's only a few demo tables, but we usually have some of them. And uh, so if you're not if you're not planning a tournament, then you're, you're hopefully trying out one of our games. And, and this year at Gen Con, we'll be taking up a fair amount of space in the uh, in the big game library room or whatever it's called, the big big area where everyone demos games, and uh, that's going to be our concentration is just to fill as much of our schedule with with demoing a- as possible. So, so so Brian, as yeah. you know, Nevermore Games, do you ever have trouble, you know, recruiting booth babes, being that the Raven is the least attractive and most foreboding of the you know avian family? You you you'd be surprised. Okay, first off, uh, that's not true. Okay, Corvids are beautiful. And, um, and, and second, <laughs> second you know, off, I, the other how many kind of, right yes, yeah. how many sinister but sexy ladies like ravens? So yeah. not a problem at all. <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> the conventions in Baltimore, I guess. I, I will. I will say um, that of the com- the conventions that I go to, none of them are terribly. Booth babe friendly and the greater than nor should they, nor should they be. It's it's no. a horrible practice. I think we yeah, all agree no, on that. Isn't yeah. Christopher enough of a booth babe for for exactly. greater than games? Look at that beard. <laughs> you, I mean, you come for the game, you stay for the beard. Let's just say right. that. That's right. <laughs> so well, we have a couple of quest. Oh, go ahead. Right? I was gonna say, do you have any you know thoughts on the experience of trying to recruit? You said you know you're recruiting minions to help you know flesh out the booth. How do you go about that? Is it just pulling your most hardcore fans? Well, we uh, we have a really active forum community on our website, and we kind of post it on our forum. Hey, who wants to work for us at uh, conventions? You'll get a free t-shirt, and if you work a certain number of hours, we'll cover your, your badge cost. And we have a lot of volunteers. So that worked out well. Very nice. Uh, your mileage may vary. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have some rabid fans, Christopher. They're not rabbits. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> oh, Maybe. Boy. You might have some rabbit fans, too, though. Could be. That's true. That's true. 
Um, but no, re really, it's a matter of you know one of the things that you that I do actually at conventions. If somebody comes up and they're in the booth every day, there are people at conventions that come up, they play the game, like oh, I love this game. They play the game every day. You know that they like your game, um, and you know that they they go to conventions. So you, I've I've talked to people before and said, man, you're really having a fun time here. Are you are you interested in coming back to this con next year? Because you're doing a good job. You know the game, and I'd be happy to get you a badge if you'd come into my booth and run the game. And so, looking at when you're at a convention, keeping your eyes open for um, for future con volunteers and things is certainly a good idea. A good well, that is a good idea for you know future publishers. Get get your true fans locked in early. You're gonna need them someday. Help you man <laughs> <Yeah>. your booth. <laughs> We've got a couple of questions from the YouTubes right now, from way back when when he got started. Um, well, let's see. Daniel Gross asked, "How many years does it t usually take to go from a local uh, local town con into a huge? I'll take a plane and ride to that game con." So I guess the evolution of a convention. Um, I guess Angelo, you could speak to that. How how big was Alcon when you got started, and when well, did you get started? We're we're kind of special because we're extremely space limited. Uh, I've been helping organize for thirteen years, uh, and when we first got started, we were the first year I got involved. We got maybe two hundred and fifty total attendees, um, and this year we had seven hundred and fifty attendees. We will never be, uh, I'll hop a plane and go to that 10,000 person con because we're held on campus at Rice University and we're already sort of you know, stressing out our space constraints. But uh, I can speak to some other cons in Houston because I do know some other con organizers. Uh, and I think the answer depends in part on um, how big you aim to be and what you can offer. Uh, so I would say uh, the cons that are growing in Houston are not just gaming cons. They're the sort of big multimedia, we have guests and autographs and panels and, and all of that cons. So if you look at uh, Comic Palooza, for instance, it's, uh, it's held in a giant convention center and they've just been uh, gaining thousands and thousands of attendees every year. So they're, they're almost doubling every year. But in order to do that, uh, you sort of need to have a ton of money to invest into it, and you also need to have uh, people who are just full time uh, promoting this con, you know, all year. That makes sense. Your point. That makes sense. So, have you guys considered you know expanding past just the gaming con, as Angela said, into the you know general geek interest world? Have any um, any experience going to those cons and setting up as a publisher? Uh, that would be for Christopher or I mean, I, I gotta, our audience is pretty well defined, or at least we're defining it, and it's it's more of it's more of the hardcore strategic gamer. Um, that being said, I've told Christopher this a million times. I, I seem to meet people. It doesn't matter in what walk of life. I mean, there's 90 year olds in you know nursing homes, you know, playing this playing Sentinels. It's ridiculous, and uh, so I, I think he's. I think I, I you know, Chris. Uh, the, we pretty much just look for any opportunity to get people to play the game, and um, I know we we have a, an awesome individual named Andy uh, who is in the YouTube uh, channel right now in the chat, um, who has organized a bunch of game days in Indianapolis. That says, you know, it, it, he'll call me up and say, "Hey, I've got nine stores that each want to have a two to three hour session with you. Come in and run demos. Will you drive out and do this?" And as long as somebody else organizes it, sure, I just, you know, no problem. So it's just a matter of wherever is willing to give me a soapbox to stand on and a table to run the game, I'll go there. Is it a convention? Awesome. Is it somebody's backyard? Well, how many people are going to walk by? Deal. <laughs> you know, going to the county fair, setting up with games. Heck yeah. So do we have any other good questions from the YouTube right now? We have another question from the YouTube. Uh, there's a bit more of an open-ended question uh, from the comments. Uh, Andy Aronson asks, what's the best size for a con? Best wow. size? For what? That's an interesting question. What are you trying to do? <laughs> yeah. Best I guess, size I guess for it, it depends on your intent. Like, Gen Con, I guess the, 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 the way I see it is, like, Gen Con could get as big as it could reasonably have space, but it's kind of already at capacity, at least in its current location. Um, before you run into issues of 
I mean, you're already at issues with things with with Gen Cons like like uh, Gen Con and PAX and Essen, especially. Um, it's a matter of you can't see everything, really, or you really you can't f spend a lot of time seeing everything. You can you can do the mile wide, inch deep sort of thing, um, or focus on a few things and miss out on a bunch of things. But I personally really like those sorts of cons because the the, the different opportunities there are really robust. Um, whereas then there's also cons that are a bit more focused, but as a result as a result you get to the, the, the issue with the focus con is if it's a focus con about something you're interested in, awesome, hooray. If it's a focus con you're not interested that doesn't have anything you're super interested in, it's a drag. Um, Ryan, you had something? Yeah, I, I think best is a very difficult, uh, difficult thing to pin down there because it really does depend on what your goal is for that convention. If I'm looking for, um, you know, if I'm there as a reviewer and I'm looking to pick up games and find the newest, best, coolest games, I'm going to want the biggest con I can get. I'm going to want something that's going to have all the brand new stuff. Obviously, the bigger cons draw the newer games. You tend to have focused releases around these big cons, uh, and that's where you're going to want to be. Now, if you're looking to game, uh, if you're looking to sit down and get a lot of game time in, smaller cons are always better, it seems. Um, I have a lot better luck in getting into whatever game I want to find at a small con. You know, there's a lot less focus on walking around and looking at things. There's a lot more focus on, on getting set down and playing the games that people have already brought with them. Uh, so I think it depends on what the focus is. If you're looking to game, I think smaller to medium. If you're looking to, to really get what's new and hot and, and just look around and see what's going on in the gaming business, the bigger the con, the better it's going to be. I will say, I, I really enjoyed the hugeness of, of Essen. Um, when I went last year, because I'm not. I get to go to Essen. <laughs> Frecken Sie Deutsch. <laughs> Drinking Essen a good beer. <laughs> Did you exhibit but, uh, and sell and sell product there? Uh, <laughs> but you know, Essen was really cool because it had so many different things. But it kind of started turning into what we see in um, American Comic Cons, where Comic Cons are called Comic Cons, but we all know they have like. Yeah, TV and movie and just general pop culture cons. And there was a giant booth display for the Ninja Turtles TV show at <laughs> Essen. And I was like, what's this all about? There's no game here. And, uh, and, that, and that's certainly a thing. that As a con gets bigger and bigger, it starts getting more and more watered down. Um, and so I think that speaks to what Ryan was talking about. At a smaller con, you can do more focused gaming. At a bigger con, you can see more stuff. So. Con dilution. I said that. I, I'm agreeing. One, one point, Ryan Metzler. First pertinent comment in 38 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Metzler is the guy who slept in class, and then he popped up with the right answer. That, believe it or not, was me. <laughs> and then he ate it. And then he, grew, and then he grew up to be a board game reviewer, just like yeah. he always wanted. <laughs> my, da story. my daddy said I could never review board games, but I proved him wrong. <laughs> he said you're too yeah, loud, Ryan. Ryan. You got a face for radio. That's true. You got something, Christopher? Uh oh, <laughs> I froze. Oh, nope. Christopher froze. No, you didn't. Yeah, I'm back. What the heck? That was weird. Right. And you're back. You had something for us? I did. I have a comment from the YouTube from um, this is kind of a weird name. T C Petty Three. Yeah. I don't know. I skipped that one. Skip Never that heard one. of that guy. All right. Uh, well, he was wanting to know... Oh, he said that he, he knows he hates not having a demo time on the schedule, and he wanted to know if people prefer having scheduled demo times on the schedule of a con, I guess as opposed to just saying, we're running demos all the time, come by whenever. I much, much prefer running demos all the time, come whenever. Yep. Yeah. Easily. Easily better. But Ange Angelo, you have a preference? Yeah. So again, it sort of depends on space. I, we have uh, we have dealers who just sit down and, and run demos of their game all the time, but it's also good uh, to just offer games that are suitable for beginners to just step up and, and, you know, you don't have to be experienced in the game. It could be scheduled, but, you know, not a tournament, I guess. Yeah, perhaps a hybrid is best. You know, have a couple times when you know it's going to start, but then run, at, you know, ad hoc in the, you know, the interim. If you have enough uh, people to do that and space to put it in, sure. Yeah, I think, I think it has a lot to do with size of the convention, too. It, it all depends. I mean, you know, Gen Con is so overwhelmingly huge that, you know, if you put, you put your game on a schedule, um, you know, when we put Chicken Caesar on there, it sold out in, like, 
a few days, and that was awesome. And we had people there to play nonstop the whole time. And even when people didn't show, we had people there with just you know the generic tickets, like waiting to play, which is which is great. Um, with, with our next game, Mars Needs Mechanics, it's a much quicker uh, uh, teach time, much quicker game to play in general. So you know we'll have those scheduled times, and then we'll just always be there. So it, you know I think a hybrid is a, a good way to go. So uh, myself personally, I've not actually been to Gen Con. Do you get a factor there. It's what? Like, like the middle of nowhere. I fly what? from you know, east coast Dude, to west coast. I don't stop in the middle. Wire just fired you. You didn't even know. <laughs> Wire's not paying anybody to go Gen Con. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> print media not doing so well. Uh, <laughs> but do you actually get people lining up, uh, you know, waiting to play in a demo? Do you get significant lines building for the more popular games? Um, I can't speak to doing demos. I can't speak to doing demos at the at the actual booths like, like Christopher did, although all you need to do is walk around and, and just people are just in lines everywhere to try out games. But even in the demo hall where we were, yeah, we had we just had like people just huddled around waiting to play a game if they didn't have direct tickets for it because they were hoping to catch it. So, Savages. Yeah, I mean, there's 40-some thousand people there, and they're all looking to, to play or try something. So, yeah, you're just going to have lines everywhere, people trying to do everything. I mean, there's even one out by the bathroom, which was just kind of weird. It was like they all wanted to go try it or something. <laughs> and, um, and you know what? You mentioned something there about 40,000-something people, and I'll sort of throw this out there as a cap to our from-the-publisher perspective. When you're analyzing a con, you're looking at what con am I going to pick, you know, how am I going to gauge how much money it's going to cost me. Always get the fine details on the actual attendance of the con. There's a very big distinction between ticket sales and turnstile count, and yeah. different cons count differently, and a lot of them are not very upfront unless you pry and, and force that information out of them. Uh, cons will take a three-day badge and count that as three people because yeah, you I've heard of that. That's three pretty distinct slimy. days. Gen Con is huge, though. I mean, no matter how you look oh, at it, it's huge. It, it def- <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen both sides of the numbers, and it definitely is uh, Gen Con's a huge than friggin' that. con. Yeah, Gen Con's uh, actually... He's talking like 40,000 people at one time. Right. Yeah. Right. I'm talking um, about... A, a, a veritable crap load of people, regardless. You can't walk yes. in that place. A metric so, crap load, if you will. Yeah, were. however many people can fit in all standing, po- all possibly standing room in, in that convention center is, is how many people were there. It's just, it's absolutely insane on Friday and Saturday. It's just crazy. So let's move on to our other perspective of the night, you know, attending a con as a reviewer. And, you know, I'll, I'll give for Ryan a little bit of a chance to go up on, on soapbox mode here and tell us what he really looks for. You know, he, he says he's going to the big cons, so he wants to see the hot games and, and you know, talk to all the companies. But how do you, what's your process here? How do you scope out your day at the con? So I, I'm not the most experienced reviewer out there, obviously. I'm, I'm relatively new to it. I've only done it with big cons a couple times now. Uh, but I guess what I do, at the beginning of the fair, if you can get there early uh, as a reviewer, get there in before like they actually open the halls. Uh, that's, that's big for the reviewers, and it's, it's a side of things that you don't often see, uh, especially the publishers see it, but the, the general attendees don't get to see it. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem that kind of goes on uh, inside of the con before the con actually starts. There's trading between publishers. There's, there's meetings with, uh, with publishers between reviewers and publishers and press and all types of people uh, that you get to see there. And so there's a lot of emailing before the con starts, Uh, in order to try and schedule times to speak with these different publishers, uh, be it, you know, the larger publishers like Fantasy Flight, uh, you try and schedule some time, or Alderac, or whoever it may be, uh, to get in there to talk to them about their products, hopefully arrange uh, to be able to get some product to do some reviews, and stuff like that. Now, during the con, it's it's really difficult for a reviewer to actually get in and and talk to to the publishers that are running their booths uh, because they're so swamped, especially things like Gen Con. Uh, I know I tried to go in to talk to Christopher at Gen Con, uh, and it was impossible to get to Christopher at Gen Con during con hours because the booth is just flooded with people who are trying to get copies of Sentinels of the Multiverse, like beating other people with copies of the game, and and it, it's insanity. But <laughs> all those old ladies that Brian was talking about playing Sentinels are just, you know... We well, hit that octogenarian market. Canes spot. going up. Right. Yeah, I, I definitely saw some old ladies with shivs. They were walking around that booth. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so I think as a reviewer, it's not so much about during the con hours. I mean, yes, I go around and I film things, and it's nice to be able to try and film people doing stuff in the con. Uh, it's nice to get demos during the day if you can. Uh, but for me, in terms of getting around these cons, it's all about um, first setting up meetings at times that aren't necessarily busy times for the publishers, uh, and then going on later, uh, trying to pick up copies of the games after the cons from publishers that didn't sell out. There's there's a period of time where you'll see all of the reviewers going around trying to scavenge things from publishers who are looking for publicity uh, at the end of a con. And so I guess, I guess those are really the important things that, that I try and manage to do is, is make a lot of meetings, make a lot of connections, and hopefully, you know, parlay those connections into potentials for review later on. Um, and I think that's really all I have to say there. Yeah, so, so it really is mainly a, a networking event during those. It is. It getting is. in early is key. You know, don't when people are trying to make their money, you don't want to go in there as you know upstart reviewer. You There's know, no got, point in talking. You've to got your blog. Inside. You decide you want to write some reviews. Yeah. Uh, you know, don't be that guy. It's it's pointless during the day to even talk to them. It's not even worth it. And, and you said something there about you know guys. You know, the scavengers at the end of the day trying to pick up copies for review. I, I do take issue sometimes with the, the people who have this attitude that I want to go up and, you know, ask publishers for review copies and they feel like they've, they're they entitled to receive free games so they can go review them. Uh, there's there's a little bit, there's a, there's a very fine balance. And I think what you said about going in and, and networking and trying to talk to the you know the companies as people, letting them know who you are, letting them know what your intentions are, and letting it flow from there. It's 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 a very fine process. It's like it's like dating a fine lady, you know, going now, up to this, be honest, this though, fine all board reviewers, game company. All reviewers still scavenge for games at some point or another. <laughs> oh, we have our moments. Yeah, yeah. You know <laughs> I will say as a as a publisher, the public Publishers should want to give their games to those scavenging reviewers. So, you know, just just as as a reviewer, go up to a publisher and be like, "Hey, I review games. Here's a a, a list. Of, you know, here's some of my my monthly views or whatever." That's the but, thing. You have to provide those credentials, though. You can't just go up and be like, "I have a blog. Give me a game." That's what we're more like, referring to. The people that give it a bad name. I think right, you're like, you're going on a very good point here. But I mean, you get a get a business card that has your your information on the front, and then like some numbers on the back. Be like, this is my monthly views or whatever. You know, like any any anything that makes you legit. And go up to a publisher and be like, hey, I review games. I've heard good things or I've heard bad things or whatever. I'd love to review your game. I haven't heard anything. Whatever. Any of those things. I was say, I don't think going up and saying I've heard bad things is a good good opening <laughs> yeah, line. I need to write some bad reviews. Can you help me yeah, out? If if you'd heard bad things about the game, but then you sat down played a demo and really liked it, mention that. Yeah, that hasn't happened very often. But yes, if that happens, I would most definitely go up to that publisher and be like, "Let me review your game. I like it, even though apparently it's crap." But but I've uh, I've had plenty of your reviewers come up to me like slinking up and be like, "What can I trade for a game?" It's like just just I know what you want, and if you are a decent reviewer and have decent views, I want you to have that thing. Yeah, it's strictly good for me. We've had this discussion before. Yeah, you were very good philosophy. By the way. There are, there are a lot of companies that don't have, you know, proper media relations set up. They don't understand the value of it. Yeah, They're and fools. and there are times you cannot explain the value to them either. I, I've tried to have that conversation to explain the value. Uh, and, and, and that's another thing I wanted to mention is open-minded publishers uh, is, is important. There are some publishers, and it, it always seems to be a, a smaller publisher thing where they don't seem to understand the value uh, of any type of exposure your game can get. Good exposure, bad exposure, name recognition is key. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I know you mentioned earlier, you know, people have this sense of entitlement, and that's not what I'm trying to get at, Matt. There are people that request games, and it's perfectly fine for a publisher to shoot any person down for a game that they want to shoot down. It's their prerogative. All and is fair. Think, huh? Fair is it's fair. A, it's exactly. all fair. Right, exactly. But... I've also gotten the attitude from some people where they're like, well, I don't need uh, that kind of exposure. And it's like, well, you know, you can either take the time to try and sit there and explain to them what the exposure will do and how it benefits them. But uh, really, I think that's the kind of research they need to do on their own. Uh, and, and you need to have these open-minded publishers who are willing and, and uh, it, to at least discuss the, the prospects that they can get from this type of thing. Um, and that isn't always out there. So... 
Uh, that's another thing that I'd like to see is just an open-minded thought from all of the publishers that are attending. You're not going to get it from everybody, but uh, it's nice to see a generic population of open-minded individuals. Yeah. Work. So, so in general here, you know, how to have a good con experience, you know, it's the title of our show, but how to have that good experience as a reviewer or the member of the media. It's as Christopher said, you come prepared, you know, you have a business card, you have all the information, you be upfront, you be honest about who you are and what you're doing. You don't get offended if you happen to bump into a couple of the closed-minded companies yep. because they do exist. Uh, yep. But th there's also a bit more. There's also a bit more to it. I mean, you don't always have to be so focused on the review. Uh, you can actually take this time that you're you're doing your networking. You're getting in early, trying mm -hmm. to talk to the people who run the companies, finding out some of the, you know, the story behind the game. You know how it was created, what was involved, what the process was like. You know, maybe you want to take the time to ask those sorts of questions, or at least set up that relationship where you can ask them later via email. That way, you don't have you know. Maybe it adds some new flavor to your review. Maybe you set yourself apart from somebody else who's writing a strict, you know, gameplay specific or component specific review of a game. So don't always be after the review. You can always take a different approach uh, if that's what you're into. And and even setting up those those if, even if you're not after the review immediately, or maybe you're not after the review at all, but setting up those connections can lead to that possibility down the road. So it's not all about getting in and getting the copies right now or getting in and getting the copies ever, but at least establishing those relationships, getting to know people in the industry so that you can make those connections later down the road and hopefully, you know, further yourself in that way and, and also get some information out, out about these games. So yeah. The last thing I would suggest, honestly, for uh, people, you know, starting a blog or writing reviews on Board Game Geek. Uh, if you do start to get media credentials, you want to go to a con, see what the con you know, can do for you. See if they can help you out at all. This probably pertains more to the larger cons, but say you go to, say you go to PAX East or PAX Prime, you know, make sure that you're aware that they have you know, media room and media services. You know, they have uh, at least one day where they have an hour where you can get in early. We talked a lot about you know, getting in early so you can have proper face time when the people aren't busy. Uh, you can do that. They have free lockers you can stash your stuff in. These are all some of the benefits that will help you have you know, a better time at your con. Uh, and you know, we, we have a con organizer here in Angelo and I'd like to ask you, you know, if you have, you know, as, as a smaller con organizer, if you have people from local media coming by, or sure, if you absolutely. do have you know, upstart game bloggers coming and trying to cover the event. Uh, we've we've had uh, we've had local and, and semi local game bloggers who contact us and ask for media passes. Um, we're small enough that we don't really put uh, passes out there, but we also don't require you to have a badge unless you want to go play scheduled events. So you can wander around the dealer room, you can interview people, you can do whatever you like. Uh, we've had people come out and film. We've had. Uh, a, a, a little more attention sometimes than we thought we would get. So, uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we're we're reasonably small though, so we don't get the uh, the sort of deluge of people who want to come in and, and learn about new games. You know. <laughs> true. True. Uh, do you ever do say like the outreach to the local media? Do you try to you know rope them in and say, yeah, we're having a big event here? We've tried. Um, it's. We're a little bit again because we're at a university. We're a little. Our hands are tied with how much we can uh, call attention to the university and call attention to ourselves. Uh, but we try. We we got the strangest request this year actually um, because our our we have a different theme every year, and this one was sort of Star Trekky. Uh, and uh, the mayor of Dallas, uh, their office. Yes, thank you for the the hand sign there. The uh, the mayor of Dallas and. Uh, Texas are putting out a new Texas scratch off lottery ticket hmm. that's Star Trek themed and they're holding some event in March with William Shatner scratch and so him. they contacted us the week of the con and said hey could we send a street team out to hand out flyers for our event which um, sort of surprised us, but we couldn't affiliate with them because we'd had to get permission from our sponsoring organization and from the university and all that. So I think if you're a professional con, even a small one in a hotel, you probably don't have your hands tied as much. True, true. Uh, as we see, feel like we're kind of wrapping up our discussion on how to have a good time as the media, I want to give you a chance here. Uh, tell us a little bit more about you know your con, and I'm very interested in the you know the annual theme. How do you go about setting that, and what sort of impact does it have on the con? 
<laughs> uh, it actually has uh, very little impact. It's more just for our own amusement and uh, what logo we'll have, to tell you the truth. The con is largely the same every year. Uh, it's uh, We just finished our 32nd con this past weekend, um, the, and the theme is whatever amusing thing we can come up with. Uh, so it's uh, we try to go by either what the year is, or you know, last year we did a, a the very stereotypical Mayan end of the world apocalypse kind of thing. So it's uh, we we just throw out. Sometimes we'll have a contest for uh, just send us art ideas uh, amongst our fans, and we'll come up with a theme that way. So and the theme is just sort of I, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's secondary to the con, uh, but the con is just pretty much all gaming. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, frankly, it's probably the only um, decent size gaming con that has survived in the uh, Houston area. Everything else seems to die off, so nice. I don't know why. So we have one last question here before we wrap up our main topic. Christopher, you got someone on YouTube? Yeah, Angelo, somebody on YouTube was asking, um, as, a, as a convention runner, are, what are you happiest to see from different types of attendance? Dealers, reviewers, players? Like, what, what's a good mix of con attendance and uh, such? Wow, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what that question means. Um, uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> what, what do I want? I want everyone to be happy and then at the end tell us they were happy. Um, so, I, you really, I, I guess, clarifying the question, what... Okay, so I, I don't know if we have time to really go back and forth a lot and clarify the question, so I'm going to ask the question Sorry. in a different way that makes sense to me. Uh, okay. So with, when you're running your convention, yeah. what, like, okay, how, much, how, many, how much space do you have for exhibitors, and does that always fill up? The, the, the space for exhibitors always fills up. We are not primarily an exhibitor con. Uh, I think we have exactly 24 tables, so we're tiny. And the, the dealer space is surrounding our central gaming area. So we've always had dealers there just as a benefit to our attendees more than anything else, uh, and it always fills up. We, all, we always have a waiting list and people who want more tables than we're willing to sell them. That's awesome. Uh, so Great. so it's, a, it's a minimal amount of, of uh, dealers, to tell you the truth. Um, the number of attendees tends to go up, like I say, a little bit, but we're really at our limits as to how much we can take. We're already spread out all over campus. Um, we would, uh, I would say we had 230 something, uh, distinct events this year. I thought uh, you were going to say so attendees, but you had more than that, didn't you? We had 750 attendees. That's more like it. Yeah. 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 So and like I said, but 230 something events. So, uh, I would say maybe a third or so of the total attendees don't have to pay for their badge because they're either volunteers or, uh, GMs running games, uh, or, um, dealers. I think most importantly, as an on-campus con, do you have any issues with streaking? <laughs> you have no idea. Uh, so if we were to hold our con on the 13th or the 31st of a month, then yes. <laughs> there's a long-standing tradition at Rice University where there's a giant streaking that goes on uh, on the 13th and the 31st of every month. <laughs> By mod streak con. Yeah, yeah. We'll have to if we ever do hold a con that uh, has the thirteenth as one of its nights, we'll probably have to have that as a theme. <laughs> well, I think that just about wraps up our main yeah. topic. Let's, let's, let's finish this point. I want to give Brian Fisher a chance here to talk about our board rumors design contest, which just wrapped up, and we are feverishly playing all of your, you know, d deck and cube games. At least Ryan Metzler is. So, Brian, you know, hit us with the details of our con that just ended. Sure. We had, and I don't have the final count in front of me, but it's like 36 or 37, something like that. A lot. -ish. Yeah, games that came in. Let me tell you how many more that was than we expected. Uh, About 30-some. Yeah. That, that was crazy. Uh, that's awesome. That's really, really awesome. So we're going to take a little bit longer than we were planning on to make sure that we give them all a fair shake. Um, so we're looking at announcing a winner and probably, probably a top three on March 21st, so a full month. Um, and then af after we do that, then we can start talking about the next contest. We'll probably um, give everybody a month to recuperate. I'm talking about us because we're about to play a lot of mini games over the next month, and then we'll do it again. So um, it it's, been, it's been awesome, and there's all kinds of different games, and, and it's just been great. Go ahead, Ryan. I just want to say I've personally worked through about a third of them so far. 
on uh, seeing lots of very interesting designs, some that you know integrally use the cubes as a part of the game, some that are more uh, using the cubes as scoring markers, some that are you know dexterity based games using Ooh. cards, uh, some that are you know secret information games. It, it's it, there's just a ton of stuff out there. Uh, I think it's really interesting all the the various ideas that people have come up with using 20 cards and 10 cubes. Uh, what what the stuff is that we've seen so far, and I'm really excited to check out the rest of them. So, uh, just give us a little bit of time, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to pick some some really great ones out of it and, and show them to you. So, thank you to everyone who sent in a submission. Definitely appreciate all the work that goes into that. So, as we're closing out here, we'll give everyone their their final thought opportunity or a chance to plug something if you want to. Uh, Angelo, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, my, my thought about, uh, if it's just cons we're talking about, my thought is to just always encourage people, if, even if you're going to a local con, try a game that you have never played before. Cons are the perfect place to do that. And Brian? Oh, sorry. I'm doing that a lot tonight, aren't I? Um, yeah, you know, <laughs> I had mentioned earlier that I'd be talking about a, getting a convention together, and it's, it's really not all that interesting. We're in, we're in the very early stages. But, you know, I hear Angelo talking about a 750-person con. That's awesome. Our con is like 100 people, and it's, 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 it's a really great group. But the, the, the reason why I mention that is because no matter how, how big or small the con is, um, you know, just going and playing with people is fun. I mean, we all love gaming. That's why we do it. Um, you know, so don't don't forget that. You know, sometimes you can get disappointed when you don't make it out to the bigger cons. Um, but you know, the bigger cons, you don't have a lot of the personal connections you have at the smaller ones and the and the medium sized ones. So um, so so stay positive. And Christopher, um, really, it's a matter of as a as a publisher. I try to get to every con, but not necessarily just as a publisher. I love going to game conventions to see what other people are doing, what the exciting things are, who's got you know what going on. The, the energy of a convention is, in general, so positive and so cool and so much fun that it's just a, it's a great place to be. And um, I think anybody who hasn't gotten a chance to go to one of the bigger gaming cons should really give it a shot. Um, Origins is coming up this summer, and it's not the biggest of the big, obviously, but it is a pretty great con, and a lot of good gaming goes on there. Very board um, game and, focused too. Hmm. Very board game focused too. Yep, absolutely, and uh, and it's and it's not very expensive at all. So, you know, if you can make it to Origins or Gen Con or even the Paxes, the Paxes are great. I love going to Pax. Um, definitely make it out because uh, there's a lot of really good opportunities no matter where in the industry you are if you're a publisher, if you're a reviewer if you're a consumer, go to a gaming convention they're awesome and I would personally say as my final thought, if you're going to go to a con you want to have a great experience, try to play with people you don't know, you know I've, I've seen people go to cons with you know, a pack of five or six people and they play all their games together and then they leave the con maybe they tried some new games Maybe they met some new publishers, but try to meet some new people too. You know, we're all gamers. We're all here to have fun. Ryan? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's some of the great aspects of conventions is meeting new people, playing new games. Uh, I use them a lot of the time as a way to uh, trade games. I don't know if anybody does that at all, but uh, there's a lot of organizational uh, things about trading games at conventions. There's math trades uh, where you can, you know, put all your games into programs and it figures out all the trading for you and then you can bring them all there and trade them with people without having to uh, ship them. So that's a great aspect of that too. Um, I don't have a whole lot more to say about cons uh, except for that I'm going to one this weekend. I'm going to have a great time. I'm going to play games with people that I know and people that I don't know. Uh, and that's Fire and Ice Con in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Manitowoc. Um, but it's going to be a Manitowoc. Manitowoc. Not as good as Oconomowoc, by the way, but... Um, oh, Wisconsin. Oh, yeah. Going to Manitowoc this weekend and going to have a great time. So, fire and ice. Uh, but that's it. All right. Well, thank everyone for tuning in live, and I thank you guys who are watching in the future. Ooh. Have a good night. <laughs>